Hi everyone, I hope you're doing well. Um, thank you for dialing in for my talk and thanks to the workshop organizers uh, for inviting me. Um, with the recent switch of uh, CPPR uh, to being fully virtual, uh, by the time the relevant information trickled down from the CPPR organizers to the workshop organizers to me, um, there wasn't enough time left uh, for me to record a talk. And so what follows um, is a talk I recently gave at a different venue. Um, it's on the same topic that I was planning on talking about at this workshop, um, but if you've already heard this talk before, um, I apologize. Um, it's also a bit longer than what the workshop organizers um, wanted, um, but hopefully with the content being async, um, it may not be too much of an issue. Um, and worst case, you could uh, consider watching it at one and a half times the speed. Um, so with all that said, um, I hope some of you uh, find this useful and interesting. Um, I don't know at the time of this recording um, what the Q&A format is going to look like at the workshop, but if there is one, I look forward to seeing you there. All right, so let's get started. Today, um, I'm going to tell you about AI systems that can see and talk. Um, and so what I mean by that is systems that can take an image like this um, and automatically describe it in a sentence um, or can take not just the whole image, but individual chunks from this image um, and describe those individual chunks in perhaps short phrases um, or systems where you can give an input um, as, as an input, this short phrase, and it shows you where in the image that particular object is, <clears throat> or where that relevant region is. Um, systems that can not just describe images, but can describe videos in perhaps um, various levels of detail and granularity. Um, systems that can take an image and instead of just sort of passively um, just describing it where you have to passively take that in, you can now actively ask questions like, what is the kid doing? And it might answer skateboarding um, or have a back and forth conversation with these systems grounded in the contents of this image. So for example, the system might start by describing this image, a dog with goggles um, in a motorcycle sidecar. Um, and you can then ask a follow-up question, is the motorcycle moving or still? And it says it's parked. Um, you can ask what kind of a dog is it? It says, looks like a beautiful pit bull mix. Um, what color is it? Light tan with a white patch that runs up to the bottom of his chin and so on. Um, so these are sort of, there are many others, but these are the kinds of tasks that we're interested in looking at in vision and language. Um, and so one might ask, why is this intersection um, of sort of, of problems at the intersection of vision and language interesting to study um, or important to study? And I think there are a few reasons why. Um, one is um, in terms of applications. If you think of uh, visually impaired users who don't have access to one of these modalities, who may not have access to the visual signal, if you have systems that can translate this visual signal to language, um, then these uh, users can now access this visual information through the language. Um, if you think of applications where there are large quantities of often unstructured visual data um, and you're trying to navigate through it, organize it, search through it, um, then language is a very natural modality to be using um, to do that. Um, if you think about a lot of the content um, on the web, um, it's, it's often inherently multimodal where you have imagery videos along with language text. Um, and so if you have ways of connecting these two, if you have meaningful ways of learning from both, then you can just learn more from this inherently multimodal information. Um, if you think of uh, problems like detecting hateful content on the web, on social media, um, a lot of times this content, again, is inherently multimodal, where in this example, for instance, the image by itself is fairly benign, the text by itself is fairly benign, but the combination of these two can make it um, mean or, or hateful. Um, and finally, if you think of um, sort of a lot of AR, VR applications, um, you are in the situation where there's this technology, this agent that is placed in this visual context around you, um, where it makes sense for you to potentially interact interact with it through language. And so again, having this bridge between vision and language is useful. So I think for a variety of these applications, it's useful to study these problems. Um, more conceptually though, even if you think about it from sort of an AI perspective, um, vision is a large portion of how humans perceive. Um, language is a large portion of how humans communicate. And to me, it seems like it's somewhat central then um, to intelligence to be able to connect this perception to this communication, um, hence the connection between vision and language. 
Um, and finally, more from perhaps a technical perspective, um, I think this is exciting for a variety of reasons. One is, I think it can play the role of pushing the boundaries of both vision and language. Um, for example, maybe more concretely in the context of vision, when you are now trying to take images and maybe describe them in sentences, you're forced to move away from this more classical bucketed recognition paradigms where you're taking images and placing them in one of a thousand different buckets or taking pixels of an image and placing them in 20 or 80 different categories to segment the image. Um, you can't do that anymore. So for example, um, if you have an image that looks like this, you may have never seen a scene like this before, but your system is expected perhaps to describe it as a steam engine is coming out of a fireplace. Um, and it's unlikely that you have a nice bucket, a nice category defined for steam engines coming out of fireplaces where you have a lot of examples and so on. So that's not likely to happen. And so you're forced to deal with um, this long tail, um, low shot uh, regime of, of things. Um, from a language perspective, I think it forces us to one ground language. We now need to connect the symbols that we see in language to specific entities that we might see in the visual data. Um, and for example, if an agent is asked to follow a certain instruction in natural language, you now need to sort of figure out what reasoning is required, what steps of operation are required based on this language um, and ground this language in objects and actions um, and some sort of a recipe to follow to, to successfully complete the task. Um, and so I think these challenges emerge when you look at the intersection of these modalities that might not emerge to this extent um, if you were looking at individual modalities. Um, another challenge, another technical challenge that comes up is that vision and language are at fairly different granularities in terms of semantics, right? So sort of the core entity um, in images are these pixels. Um, they're more sort of continuous, whereas language has these um, discrete symbols and you're trying to reason across both. And so you need to think about what are reasonable ways of doing that. Um, similarly, vision, again, the pixels start at very low level information. Any one pixel doesn't have any semantic meaning. Um, but in language, if you look at individual words, they already have a lot of semantics in them. And so again, when you try and reason between these two modalities, you have to figure out how to deal with these discrepancies in a, in a reasonable way. Um, and finally, one thing that comes up when you're looking at the intersection of two modalities is that for different tasks, it's very easy for models to latch on to any one modality or, or the other, um, which can make these models fairly biased. Um, and so again, you have to think about how do we control for these biases from both modalities and have a reasonably balanced um, model in, in that sense. Um, all right, so with that introduction, um, let me just tell you what I'm hoping to accomplish today. So one, I'm hoping to convince you why vision and language is interesting and important to work on, and hopefully I just did that. Um, I then want to tell you a little bit about where the current technology stands, um, what we can do today in vision and language. Um, and then I want to tell you um, quite a bit about some of the challenges that remain. Um, some of these are challenges where we've made some progress um, some challenges are where I think we haven't made much progress at all, and I'll try and give you a taste for um, both flavors of these challenges. All right, so let's start with this, um, with the second one. Uh, where do we stand in, in vision and language today? What can we do? Um, and so I'm going to talk about this mostly um, in the context of visual question answering. Um, and so visual question answering is the task where you're given an image, um, you're given a free form natural language question, like what is the mustache made of? And we're trying to um, design, develop AI systems that can answer this question um, accurately. Um, and so I like this task um, for a variety of reasons. One is it's um, it's a fairly broad task. Um, it's, uh, it's open-ended. You can be asking any question about any image. Um, and in that sense, it can be sort of arbitrarily complex. Um, but what's nice is that unlike some other language generation-like tasks, it is still reasonably feasible to evaluate this in a, in a somewhat quantitative way um, because the answers to these questions are often short, um, single word, few word um, uh, phrases. And so um, that's, that's, that's something that's nice about this. Um, and so when we first started working on this um, a few years ago, we introduced this uh, VQA data set um, which is uh, which is fairly large. It has over two hundred thousand images. It has over one million questions um, that were sourced uh, sourced on Amazon Mechanical Turk, um, and it has over uh, eleven million answers. 
Um, and what's nice about this data set is that for every question, um, there are two images that are that look similar to each other, but where the answer to that question is different. Um, and so the model really has to um, look at the image, understand certain subtleties about the image to be able to answer the question accurately. So for example, in this case, um, who is wearing glasses? Here are two images that are somewhat similar, but in one case, uh, the man is wearing glasses. In the other case, the woman is wearing glasses. Um, here, where is the child sitting? In one case, it's the fridge. In the other case, it's arms. Um, is the umbrella upside down? Yes. In one case, no. In the other, um, how many children are in the bed? Uh, two in one case, one in the other. Um, and so let me now uh, give you a sense for sort of what a typical model architecture looks like for VQA, for visual question answering. Um, and so you have as input this image, um, you have this reformed natural language question. Um, there's usually some uh, mechanism to encode this question, typically a deep neural network. Um, and you have some mechanism <coughs> to extract visual features from this image, again, typically a deep neural network. Um, and then there's often some attention mechanism that based on the question encoding, you might attend more to some visual features than others based on uh, different words in the question or different phrases in the question. You might attend to other words and phrases in the question differently. And so there's several attention mechanisms that people have looked at. Um, and then there is this fusion step where you're combining the information from your language, from the question, from your image. Um, and then there's often some sort of a classifier layer um, that spits out an answer. So in this case, is the boy in yellow wearing a helmet? The answer is no. Um, and so there's been a lot of work, uh, many different papers on each of these individual components. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not going to have a chance to talk about that in detail. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit more about this visual feature extraction step um, in the context of trying to give you a sense for what these typical model architectures look like today. Um, and so in, in, the, uh, in, in 2018, uh, Peter Anderson and his collaborators had introduced um, this uh, work called uh, bottom-up, top-down attention. Um, and so I want to tell you a little bit about that because that's become more or less the default way of encoding images of, of extracting features, especially in the context of these vision and language tasks. Um, and so a little bit more about that. Um, sort of before this work, the standard way of um, encoding visual features was to have sort of this grid-like um, pattern on the image, and each one of these regions is encoded um, using sort of a convolutional neural network. Um, and what Peter Anderson and his collaborators um, pointed out was that this grid-like pattern might not be the thing that makes most sense when you're trying to, especially for vision and language tasks, it might make more sense for these regions to be centered around um, objects in the image, around regions that might look like objects, and, and then have those encoded, again, through similar CNN architectures. And so that was sort of the main shift um, in 2018, and a lot of uh, today's uh, models follow this paradigm. Um, and what's nice about this is that we can now leverage um, data sets that have uh, very rich annotations for objects and attributes. So for example, Visual Genome has all these annotations for these different objects with different attributes and adjectives. Um, and we can leverage all of that to train object detectors, train attribute detectors, and use those um, to then feed our visual extraction pipeline. Um, and so we've been organizing a challenge on VQA for, um, I think, five years at this point. There's one coming up at CVPR uh, this year. Um, and we've seen tremendous progress. I mean, the y-axis, these are absolute accuracies. And we've seen already 20% improvements, um, as, as you can see here. Um, and so that's been, that's been very exciting uh, to see. Um, and so sort of accuracies are nice, but let me try and give you a qualitative sense for the kinds of things that these models can do now. Um, so this is, uh, we have this demo on vqa.cloudcv.org where you can upload um, any image and you can ask a question like how many people are in the image. Um, and in this case, the model says uh, five. Um, are there any women? <laughs> um, and the model accurately recognizes that no, there aren't any women. Um, what are they wearing? And the model says suits. Um, what are they doing? The model says talking. Is it an informal setup? The model says no. Um, seems a bit confused. Let's see if it's consistent. Is it a formal setup? The model says yes. It's much more confident this time. What else is in the image? 
flag building men, flags, microphone, and so on. Um, so you can see that it does reasonable things. Um, I mean, these examples are uh, somewhat cherry picked. This is a pre-recorded video, but it's it's still fairly representative. Um, you can check it out. And um, so what is in this image? It says baby. Um, where is the baby in the sink? Uh, it's natural to ask, what is the baby doing in the sink? The model says brushing teeth. With what? A toothbrush. Is there a towel in the image? Yes. How many towels are there? It says two, and that's interesting. It's probably seeing the actual towel and then the reflection in the mirror. Um, what color is the towel? White. Does the baby look happy? No. <laughs> and so I think I decided that I'm not quite done with the baby picture yet. So I had some more questions. What is the baby wearing? Overalls. What color are the overalls? It says blue. Um, the next best guess was blue and red with low confidence, though. Um, what else is in the image? Towel, hair dryer, sink, and so on. Um, here's one more example. Um, what is in the image? The cell phone, phone. Um, and like I said, you're welcome to try this out. It can be any image, any question. Um, you can see what these models say. What is the person doing? Taking picture. What is the person taking the photo with? Phone, cell phone. Um, and so this is interesting. For some of the earlier models, the language bias used to be so strong that if you say, what are they taking a picture with? Um, it would probably just say camera. But in this case, it recognizes that it was, it was a phone. Um, it also used to be hard to find uh, many examples where these models succeed at answering the question easily. And it's uh, now becoming easier and easier where you can just ask any question about any image. And it often says reasonable things. Certainly not always. It's still easy to find examples where it breaks. Um, but things are qualitatively, you can tell that things are much better now. All right. So with that, um, yeah, like I said, you can check this out yourself. You can try it out on various images and see what you think. Um, and I do want to say that one thing that I like um, about vision and language is that it makes this technology very accessible, right? With a demo like this, um, even someone who's not a technology person or isn't sort of fluent in artificial intelligence and um, other things like that, they can just try this out. They can upload an image, they can ask questions, they can see what AI does. And it sort of helps ground um, what technology today really can or cannot do um, as, a, as opposed to sort of much of the hype that they might read about otherwise. Um, and so we saw this happen with our uh, other demo visual chatbot um, where we've trained models um, that can have a back and forth conversation with you grounded in images. Um, and it, we found that it sort of became fairly popular on Twitter. Um, and I think it was, uh, it, it probably started with um, Janelle Shane. She's um, uh, a public speaker. Um, she writes, she has this blog called AI Weirdness, <laughs> where she writes about um, various AI technologies and funny ways in which they break and things like that. Um, and so she had uh, a few of these tweets where she would try this bot out and sort of have this meta commentary on the kinds of things it's doing. So here there's this image she uploaded. Um, it said a person is standing on a hill with a kite flying in the sky. And she asked, um, she's like, neat, what color is the kite? Um, and the model says it's a black and white photo, so I can't tell. Um, and so she's commenting on sort of a uh, nice save bot. Um, here's another one where she's saying, well, that took a frightening turn. Um, she had uploaded this image. Um, there was a description um, where it, the model just says, I mean, there's clearly a lot going on in the image, but the model is just saying a teddy bear sitting on a table with a teddy bear on the back. <clears throat> And so she's like, I see just teddy bears and tables. And the model is, uh, model says yes. And she's like, no, um, people. The model says no. Um, and she's like, no unicorns either. The model says no. Um, she asks how many teddy bears are there. The model says four. What are the teddy bears doing? They're just standing and looking at the camera. 
Uh, she's like, that's creepy. Are they alive? The model says, yes. Um, oh, yikes, yeah, should we run? <laughs> and the model says, yes. Um, here's one where someone's commenting on how this is their new favorite hobby to just sort of play with this model. Um, this is where someone um, uploaded a screenshot of the model, of, the, of this interface back to the model. And obviously, the model doesn't know how to describe it. It just has a whole bunch of these unknown tokens and unk, uh, unk, unk with an unk, unk on it. Um, how big is the unk, unk very large? Is it dangerous? No. Is it angry? No. How many are there? Too many to count. Um, do they love each other? Yes. Should I give them some privacy? I don't think so. Um, what do they want? I can't tell. Um, and people picked up on this. People, um, someone is like, I, it really has a thing for unks, whatever an unk is. And someone's commenting on how it's probably code for unknown. Um, and, and so on. So you can, again, this makes these um, makes these models, this technology somewhat accessible for people to poke at. Um, here's someone commenting on how this model um, seems to identify a lot of things as surfboards, um, which is quite insightful because these models have been trained on the Coco data set, which has a lot of surfboards in it. Um, and so it's not surprising that this model has picked up on that. Um, here's someone who actually tries to teach the model um, and get the answer right. So they say, how many lights do you see? The model says one. Um, they say, no, there are five lights. And now they're asking the model again, how many lights do you see? Of course, our model isn't quite trained to be able to learn from uh, what a human is teaching them. So the model continues to say one. And this person still doesn't give up. There are five lights. How many lights do you see now? Um, and the model still says one. Um, here's, um, and I promise you this is one of the last few ones, um, here's one where Janelle um, uses uh, uh, an, an attention GAN to take in as input a description and produce an image, and then she takes this output image and feeds it back to the visual dialogue model to see what the model, uh, to see what the model says about it, and she finds that the two are, the two in this case um, tend to be consistent, and then she kind of keeps repeating this loop that she takes the description of the visual dialogue model feeds it back to attention and, and, and goes back and forth. Um, and so you can check out her um, blog and some of her other work if you're interested. Um, all right, so with, with that, um, let me now switch gears to talk about um, some of the challenges that uh, we, uh, that I think currently still exist in the vision and language space. Um, and so here, um, I first want to give you examples of challenges where I think we've made some progress. Um, and so uh, one is uh, sort of we used to see that a lot of these models had fairly strong um, language priors and wouldn't uh, ground their decisions sufficiently in images. I want to tell you a little bit about that. Um, but related to that is um, looking at how we can integrate some of the vision modules that we know work quite well, like object detection, OCR, into these vision language systems. Um, not much of that had happened in this sort of end-to-end -end paradigm of training these models. Um, and I finally want to tell you about um, generic um, visual linguistic representations as opposed to having these individual representations trained for these different tasks. Um, so let me get let me get started with that. Um, and so the motivation behind uh, sort of this first concern uh, where uh, language uh, ends up sort of taking over, ends up having a, 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 a strong prior um, is the following. So for several years now, we can do things like take an image like this and um, describe it as a man in blue wet suit is surfing on wave, um, not an image like this, a group of young people playing a game of Frisbee, um, a car is parked in the middle of nowhere, um, a pot of broccoli on a stove and so on. Um, but then every so often you might take an image like this and you get a description that says a dog is sitting on a couch with a toy. Um, and this is obviously it's not accurate. Um, but if you squint at this image, you can maybe understand why the model might be saying this, right? It sort of looks like an indoor scene. Um, it's probably the case that in your training data set um, for most indoor scenes where there's a dog in the image, it's probably sitting on a couch. There might be some sort of a toy around it. Um, and so that's why it might be saying this. Um, so why, while it's understandable, it's, um, it's still sort of unsatisfying, especially because we know that we have pretty good couch detectors um, now in computer vision, right? That's not that hard of a problem. Um, and so it seems like there should be a way for these captioning models to take advantage of the fact that we know how to detect couches and dogs and toys and so on. 
um, to be able to make these captioning outputs more grounded in the image so that we can get these models to not just use the statistics of the training data set that dogs, whenever they're indoor, they're usually on couches. So I'm just going to say that. And instead, actually look at what they're seeing in the image and use that to describe the image. Um, and it, this is interesting because actually, if you look at um, some of the captioning approaches before uh, deep learning became this popular, they were very much grounded in images where you would explicitly run object detectors, attribute detectors, and then have some sort of like a graphical model on top of it to reason across this. And then you would produce this um, templated but grounded description, like this is a photograph of one dog and one cake and so on. And so this was work from Tamara Berg's group um, called Baby Talk back in 2011. Um, and then what happened with um, deep learning becoming this popular is that we sort of threw out all these intermediate modules of, indiv of individual object detectors, and we just had this end-to-end -end system that produces um, much more natural sounding captions as opposed to templated language. But then we sort of lost this very concrete grounding of the language that's generated into entities that are in the image. And so what we proposed um, a couple of years ago, I guess at this point, was this approach that um, first produces, um, a, a, that first generates a template with empty slots in it. So for, for example, a blank with a blank is sitting at blank with a blank. And then these blanks are filled in with explicit outputs of object detectors. So they're filled in with entities that the model has actually seen in the image. And we think this is sort of a nice combination of the description being grounded while still being natural sounding because the template hasn't been hand defined with something that's produced by the model. Um, and so one nice thing about this is we can now plug in different object detectors and we can see how the description from these models change, right? So for example, if you don't use any object detector, you have your end-to-end -end model, it might say a close-up of a stuffed animal on a plate. Um, if I now plug in a detector that isn't all that great, it thinks the teddy bear is a person, it thinks this piece of pie, the slice of pie is a sandwich, um, it might say a person is sitting at a table with a sandwich. Um, if you now have a better object detector, it says a teddy bear sitting on a table with a plate of food. Um, and now if you have this very fine-grained object detector that recognizes this teddy bear as a specific Mr. Ted, um, it recognizes the pie, it says a, a Mr. Ted sitting at a table with a pie and a cup of coffee. Um, some other things that you can do as a result of this framework is um, you can now do robust captioning. And what I mean by that is the following. So if at test time you see an image like this, and let's say at training, um, you've never seen um, a cat and a remote control in the same image, your language model is not going to be very happy with talking about cats and remote controls in the same sentence because it's never seen that during training. But if you're grounding your descriptions in outputs of object detectors and the object detector sees a cat, it sees a remote control, a model like neural baby dog um, is more willing to talk about the cat and the remote control in the same image. Um, and you can sort of push this to the extreme where now you can say that we could describe images that have objects in them that were never seen um, during the captioning in the captioning training data set. So you've never seen an image with a zebra described in a sentence, um, but you know how to detect zebras because you've trained object detectors for zebras and you can now generate captions for these images, even with these novel objects in them. Um, and this is actually fairly critical for um, real world problems. Um, when you're trying to describe images in the wild, you can't expect for every object to have been described in sentences with enough examples for us to just learn everything end to end. Um, and so here's an example to illustrate that point of how these systems fail um, if you don't have enough examples in the captioning training set. So for example, for this image, the model says two hot dogs on a tray with a drink, makes sense, two elephants and a baby elephant walking together, makes sense, um, a brown sheep standing in a field of grass, sounds great. Um, but in this one, the model says a man in a white shirt is playing baseball, which isn't quite what's happening. Or here it says a zebra is laying down on the grass, which again, is not accurate. Um, and if you poke at why this is happening, um, you have enough examples of hot dogs in your captioning training data set. You have enough examples of elephants, of sheep, um, but you haven't seen that many examples of karate. You've seen many more of baseball. And so that uh, correlation is that training data set prior is taking over. Um, and again, you've seen many more images of zebras than of tigers. And so um, that, that prior is taking over when you're generating a caption. And so to sort of push this, um, push more, to encourage more work in this direction of describing novel objects, um, we've uh, created this benchmark that um, that lets you test exactly that. And so I, I welcome you to check that out. 
Um, all right, so let me, so that was an example of image captioning and some work that we've done to make these captions more grounded in images. Um, let me talk about uh, that uh, also in the context of visual question answering, um, where again, if you look at examples of what models can do, I just showed you the demo as well, these models can do um, impressive things. Um, what is the cat wearing? It could say hat. What is the weather like? Rainy. Um, what surface is this? Clay. Um, what is the weather like? Sunny. Um, what color is the cat's eyes? Green. What toppings are on the pizza? Mushrooms, and so on. Um, but then again, um, every so often you ask it a question like, what color are the safety cones? Um, the ground truth answer is green, but the model says orange. Um, and if you poke at why the model might be um, saying orange instead of green, um, if you look at the training examples, um, what color are the cones? The answer is orange. What color is the cone? The answer is orange. What color are the cones? The answer is orange. And so the model has perhaps learned that whenever someone asks me about the color of cones, I should just say orange. Um, and I'll probably be right as opposed to um, sort of looking at the image and grounding my answers in it. And that's that's obviously not desirable behavior. And so what we did was we introduced this new split of the VQA data set that we call VQA CP, VQA under changing priors, where condition on the question type, the distribution of answers is significantly different between train and test. So for example, during training for the question, what color the popular answers might be white, red, blue, and so on. But at test time, um, for the question, what color the popular answers might be black and pink. And so models that are just sort of transferring priors from the training set to uh, to the test to the test set are going to fail miserably. Um, but models that are actually grounding their answers based on content that they see in images will be able to generalize better. Um, and we did find this, that sort of the details of what these models are are not important. Um, the individual col columns are not important. Um, but models, when tested on this changing prior split, um, perform significantly worse. Um, and we've done, us and others in the community have done quite a bit of work of trying to, of trying to bridge this gap. And so here's one example of a model that we had introduced, um, but I'll simplify this for you. The core idea is that it separates out the part of the model that just looks at the relevant regions in the image and just recognizes what the visual concepts are. So for example, there's a dog, um, it's furry, it's white. It's just sort of recognizing all these objects and attributes. And the part of the model that decides what the appropriate answer space is, am I supposed to give a color as an answer? Am I supposed to give a number as an answer? That has been separated out. These two components don't talk to each other. Um, and only after these have been um, sort of resolved individually um, are these combined to then decide what the answer should be. So if I now know that the answer that I'm looking for is a color and I have seen the color white in the region, in, in the image region, then I will predict white as an answer as opposed to sort of everything being end to end where um, just knowing what color might give the model a hint that it should probably say white. In this case, it actually has to see the color white to say white. Um, and we found that this helps on this uh, VQACP split quite a bit. All right, here's another um, example where uh, VQA can benefit significantly from grounding. Um, so if we look at which questions um, in the last VQA challenge were considered to be difficult, and by this I mean, um, I think all top 10 entries uh, in the challenge could not answer these questions accurately. Um, it turned out that most of these questions were things like, what is the name of, what is the number on, what is written on, what does the sign say, and so on. Um, all of which have in common OCR, where the model needs to read text in the image, reason about it to be able to answer these questions accurately. Um, and all of the top models uh, that were submitted with this challenge were failing at these questions. And it turns out this wasn't just in 2019. We saw the same trend in 2018, 2017, 2016, and so on. Um, and the reason, if you think about it, is fairly obvious that none of these models had OCR integrated in them, which um, is very surprising because OCR is actually one of the um, earlier vision technologies that have been successful and have used in industry and so on. So it's a, it's, it's a problem where, that, where vision works really well. Um, what's also interesting is that it turns out um, that uh, visually impaired users, a lot of the questions that they tend to have often need re reading capabilities. For example, they might ask about when the can of soup is expiring or what temperature the oven is set to. Um, and these models would just entirely fail on that. So here are more examples where OCR is required, where these um, models just fail um, and produce um, inaccurate answers. Um, and so what we did is we collected this um, uh, large data set called text VQA, um, where all the questions 
in this data set are the kinds of questions that need the model to read and reason about text and images. Um, and we had this model that has the usual pipeline of processing the question, processing the image, but it had this extra component where there's now an OCR module that's reading the text and images. Um, and there is this copy module that before answering, it decides whether it wants to use sort of the regular answer vocabulary as one of its answers, or if it wants to copy one of these OCR tokens as the output answer. Um, and so we had, uh, we organized a challenge on this last year, but also organizing a challenge on this this year. Um, the deadline for this year is um, over a month out, so mid-May. Um, the state of the art last year was um, at about 32% on this data set. The current state of the art, as far as I know, is at 45%. Human performance is, 80, is at 85, so there's um, sort of significant room for improvement um, in the next few years, I imagine. Um, there's also this analogous data set by my collaborators for captioning, where a captioning model now needs to um, read and reason about text and images in order to describe it accurately. Um, and they have an associated challenge um, at CVPR this year as well. Um, so just to give you a glimpse of some of the vision and language challenges that I'm aware of, this is all happening at CVPR. Um, and these uh, results will be presented at a workshop we are organizing um, at CVPR. Um, and so there are various versions of visual question answering um, uh, including on VizViz, which focuses on data that was collected by uh, visually impaired users and the questions that they had for those images, um, also with captioning and reading um, text and images and also on visual dialogues. So all of these challenges are happening and I encourage you to take to, to uh, check those out and participate in them if you're, if you're interested. Um, all right, so those were uh, sort of two related things that I wanted to talk about, about getting these models to be actually grounded in images um, and not sort of have language priors take over. Um, this last piece um, that I want to talk about is uh, this idea of having uh, generic visual linguistic representations. Um, and so let me motivate that a little bit, um, where if you think, if you notice sort of all the work, or at least most of the work that I'm aware of in vision and language, um, has been of this following flavor, right? Where there's some tasks that you're interested in, say visual question answering. And so you'll go out and collect a data set for VQA, you'll train specific model architectures for VQA, and then you can sort of see how well these models do. Um, if you want to do captioning, you do the same thing again. You have a captioning data set, you train specific model architectures on that, um, and you try and solve the problem. You then do that over again for some other tasks that you might be interested in and so on. And so it ended up being this paradigm of very sort of task and data specific um, efforts um, and models that are being trained, which if you think about it is not sort of very intellectually satisfying, right? It feels like that there, there, there must be some core vision and language um, grounding that can be learned, some core visual, visual linguistic representations that can be learned, which can then be fine tuned for a variety of tasks to deal with sort of the different APIs, if you will. Um, but that's not what was happening. Um, and um, another downside of this, perhaps more concretely, is that you end up with different visual linguistic representations that are being learned. So for example, for this image, if you ask a VQA model, what type of plant is this? It says banana. Um, but then you ask a captioning model to describe this image, and it says a bunch of red and yellow flowers on a branch, right? So these two different models have two different understandings of what the same region of the image is, which is not very satisfying. Um, and so what we were after was sort of a common model for visual grounding, um, which can then also sort of leverage, um, uh, which you can then leverage for a variety of uh, vision and language tasks. Um, and so sort of have this common backbone that you can use for, for various tasks. Um, and so with that motivation, um, we had this paper called Wilbert. Um, it is one of many different um, vision and language BERT-like models um, that all came out at the same time. So I, I um, invite you to check those out as well. Um, and so what this model does is it essentially tries to pre-train these basic uh, a generic set of visual linguistic representations, which you can then fine tune for a variety of tasks. Um, and this recipe is sort of what is very popular in vision already, is becoming more and more popular in language now as well, um, but was completely lacking in the vision and language space. Um, and so just, I won't be able to go into a lot of the details, but just to uh, give you a sense for the kinds of things we had to think about to pre-train these representations um, one is on what sort of a data set can be pre-trained, right? And so we use um, this conceptual captions data set that has, I think, over 3 million images um, with associated text from the web that we can use to pre-train these representations. Um, 
we have to think about the fact, like I mentioned earlier in the talk, that uh, both these modalities, vision and language, are at very different levels of abstraction. And so we have to think about how to deal with that. And so we had these two stream model, which then appropriately interacts at the, at the, right, at the right levels, um, as opposed to sort of having these individual streams being processed. Um, and then how do we fuse these modalities? And we had a co-attention mechanism through which each, mo each modality can um, attend to the other in appropriate ways and so on. Um, and so what we showed was uh, we can pre-train this model and then fine-tune it for five different downstream tasks. Um, and what we showed was that Wilbert at the time outperformed state-of-the-art on all of these tasks. Um, and since then, we've sort of pushed this forward where um, what I presented so far for Wilbert was one backbone model, but it's still fine-tuned for these individual tasks. So if you want to solve um, VQA, you're still using a different model instance than for um, image caption matching, let's say because you fine tune the model separately for both these tasks. Um, and so that was still a little unsatisfying. And so more recently, we had this work where we where you really just have one model um, that has all these different heads for all these different models. Um, and this one model can um, can solve these 12 different um, these uh, 12 different tasks at the same time. And what we found actually is that this model does benefit from this multitask setup where this one model now has higher performance on average across these tasks. Um, than a model that would have been 12 times the size because you would have had a separate model for every task. And so that I thought was very exciting. Um, and we had state of the art on seven of these 12 tasks um, after fine tuning. Um, and so I just want to sort of emphasize um, what this means, right? So what this means is we finally have one model where you can give it an image and a question and it will answer the question. You can give it an image and a caption and it will give you a score for how similar they are. You can give it an image and a phrase, and it will draw a box around where that object is. Um, you can give it two images and a caption that's describing both those images, and it will tell you whether that's a match or not. Um, and so all of this is happening with one single model, uh, which I think is very, very exciting. And so I want to take um, a few minutes to show you a demo of this. So this is um, a very fresh, uh, <laughs> a very new demo that we just built um, very recently in the last couple of weeks. Um, uh, so Rishabh Jain uh, helped put this together. And so what you can do now is you can either pick any one of these images or you can upload your own. So in this case, I'm going to upload um, an image. Um, and now um, with the same with the same model, I can do any one of these. Here we've listed eight different tasks. Um, you can ask it a question like we already saw earlier. Where is this picture taken? You can probably hear my typing in the background. Hopefully, it's not too loud. And it says kitchen. Um, you can now ask it a spatial reasoning question. Um, what is behind the man in the red shirt? And the model says refrigerator. Um, you can ask it a pointing question. So you can say, um, which object is red? And the model will give you back uh, bounding boxes of what it believes are red objects. Um, these are reasonable responses, the red t-shirt and apple. Um, you can give it a referring expression. So I can just give it a phrase like a boy. Um, and it will give you back bounding boxes that are hopefully around the boy in the image. Um, let's try a girl. And yeah, now it gives you bounding boxes around the girl. Um, you can give it a referring dialogue. So this is the guess what task where you're essentially giving it like a 20 questions like a dialogue. And based on that, it will give you the object that it believes satisfies these uh, questions. So for example, you can say, is it edible? And the answer is yes. So you're looking for an object that's edible. Is it red? Um, let's say yes. Um, and so now it's looking for an object that's edible and, and red, and it does, in fact, find this apple. Um, we can now change that a little bit. Is it red? No. Um, is it yellow? The answer is yes. So we're looking for something that's edible, not red, but is yellow. And it does, in fact, find the bananas. Um, and so you should remember that these are all, this is all one single model that can do all of these various tasks. Um, this is visual entailment. So if you give it a statement like 
this family is sad. Um, and it says this is false. It's a contradiction with what it's seeing in the image. Um, we also have a couple of tasks that need more than one image. And so let's go ahead and upload, um, in this case, two images. So these are the two images um, that we've picked. Um, and you can now give it a caption about these two images. So you can say both images have three people in them. Um, so this is not true. So let's see what the model says. The model says false. Um, let's say the image on the right has three people in them. This is not true either. Let's see what the model says. The model says false. Um, just to kind of push it a bit, the image on the left has three people in them. And it says true. Um, so this, obviously, these are examples that I have uh, tried out as of last night, but it actually wasn't that hard to find examples where the model does reasonable things. And that's sort of what, in fact, still continues to surprise me the most about, the, about these things, where that was not the case <laughs> a few years ago. Um, and so here's an image retrieval task where I've selected a pool of four images um, and I can give it various captions like, um, I don't know, a girl flying a kite on the beach. And it's supposed to, it's supposed to sort these four images based on the relevance to this caption. Um, and so it, it gives, it returns the right image as the first result. Um, a father and two kids. We don't actually know if if that person is um, is the father, but we'll see. The model probably will think so. So it returns that a mother and daughter. And it returns the right image. Um, we can also do more abstract things like a busy scene which I would imagine the street scene probably matches that better than the rest. Yeah, and one last one, peaceful scene. Perhaps more subjective, but each image would be a reasonable response. And that's what it finds. Um, so yeah, so this, I just sort of want to stress that this is one model that can do all of these things, which I personally think is uh, is very exciting. Um, and it's also amazing what these models can do now. <laughs> so I encourage you to, so this is wilbert.cloudcity.org. Um, and so I encourage you to go check that out, play around with it. Um, and if you have any feedback, please do reach out to us. Um, all right. Um, so that's the demo. Like I said, Rishabh helped build this just in the last couple of weeks. So thank you, Rishabh. Um, and you're welcome to check this out. All right. Um, I want to quickly talk a little bit about um, some challenges in vision and language where there's been very little progress, in my opinion. Um, and so one is um, sort of there hasn't been a lot of work in using diverse visual data. A lot of the data set, a lot of the tasks that we look at in vision and language are all centered around um, uh, around COCO. Um, so it's not all of the tasks, but many of them tend to be centered around COCO. And so we don't really have um, a lot of signal on how well these models generalize to different visual data. Um, incorporating external knowledge. So things like being able to answer a question like what can the red object on the ground be used for or um, um, what sort of vehicle uses this item and things like that where you need to use external knowledge in addition to the input image and the question to be able to answer the question. Um, there are several efforts. I've listed a couple here. There are some others um, that have looked at this, but I think there's still a lot to be done here and I don't think we quite have a grasp on what the right way of going about this is. Um, evaluating these models for downstream tasks. So when I started, when I sort of motivated a lot of the vision and language work, I was talking about how it's a good way for a human to interact and sort of get certain tasks done. But most of the evaluation that we see of these vision and language models tends to be without a human in the loop, right? It's on some static benchmark that we've that we've defined. And I think that's that's problematic. So we've done some work on trying to see how a human AI team can accomplish a task um, there's been some work that we've done on machine-machine uh, teams um, conversing, sort of communicating through language um, to accomplish a task. What happens there is the language tends to drift, and so it stops being human interpretable, which means any model that we train here may not be capable of uh, communicating with a human. Um, and so very recently, we've done some work, and I think others have done work like this as well, 
where we sort of pre-train the speaker and freeze that so the language doesn't drift. And then you sort of only update the planner that decides what to talk about to accomplish a certain task. And I think those those directions are promising. But again, there, there's much more work to be done there. Um, we similarly also haven't um, sort of done a very good job of evaluating these models in real applications. We often talk about um, applications for visually impaired users, for instance, as being a motivation, but we don't actually um, see if the technology that we're developing is useful for that. Um, and so one effort that does that is this VizWiz data set from uh, Dana Gurari and others, where they have data from visually impaired users, images, questions. Um, and so I think larger efforts of this sort where we can benchmark how well this technology works, I think would be very exciting. Um, other languages, most everything that I talked about um, was centered around English as, as the representative of, of language. Um, there's been some work on sort of Japanese and other languages in the visual question answering space, um, but there isn't a lot and I think much more can be done there um, as well. Um, and studying biases, so I talked about sort of um, how language can take over um, in some other tasks, maybe vision takes over, um, but there are several other biases that get represented in these data sets. So there has been work on gender bias, for instance, that um, that studies and tries to propose models that helps um, rectify to some extent um, these biases that might show up in these data sets. And so I think there's a lot more to be done there. Um, and in the sort of free form vision language intersection, um, it's even more challenging to identify these biases, which ones are reasonably representative of the world and are okay to have, which ones are representative of the world but are not okay to have, and which ones aren't even representative of the world and are just representative of the data set. And how do we separate all of these out and uh, all of these out and deal with them appropriately? So I think all of this, all of these are open questions. All right, so to summarize uh, most of my talk, um, I think vision and language is exciting. It's an exciting space to be working in. Um, it has some important applications. Um, and I think overall, it's just sort of very fertile ground um, that has a lot of room for creative ideas and um, task definitions, data sets, evaluation protocols, what kinds of models we can train, um, what kinds of applications make sense, which applications are already accessible, reachable, um, studying biases, human AI teams. There's just a lot to be done in this space. And I think that's very exciting. Um, it is pretty amazing. I'm still fascinated when I play with these demos, which is why I spent a good amount of time on it in my talk. Um, I encourage you to do that as well, but it still sort of blows my mind of what these models um, can do already. Um, but of course, it's very easy to break them um, and there's lots more to be done going